In this episode of Growing Carnivorous Plants, we will be checking in on the terrarium known as Humpty Doo and the five species of carnivores that grow within. The planting process was quite worrying, as nearly all the species I was working with at the time were juvenile plants with very sensitive root systems. My mind was everywhere. I wondered, are they going to live? Would it be too dry? Or would algae and mold take over faster than I could manage it? There were so many variables to consider and I was checking on the terrarium daily. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have good news. The terrarium is doing better than ever. The sundew seeds have germinated. The sphagnum is nice and lush. And we even have a new species of Utricularia popping up out of nowhere. But before we go any further, I'd like to give you a warm welcome to Hypnotic Exotics. <laughs> Terrariums can be both the easiest and the hardest way to grow carnivorous plants. It all comes down to the approach. You can't just go to a hardware store, buy a fly trap, and expect it to live wonderfully in a fish tank. Because just like with any plant, it has specific needs that need to be accounted for. Let's take a quick look back at how we turned this boring glass jar into a carnivorous sanctuary. To avoid rot while still providing moist conditions, a water reservoir was constructed in the base of the terrarium using quartz rock, window screen, and sphagnum moss-filled PVC wicks. To promote the flow of moisture from the reservoir to the rest of the terrarium, different mixtures of sand, perlite, and peat were used, with the mixes having a higher amount of peat moss towards the top of the terrarium. The humidity is maintained by a small colony of live red sphagnum moss growing at the base of the terrarium which now also acts as an early warning system for underwatering. Light is then provided by a powerful 5000 Kelvin spotlight placed mere inches from the enclosure, plugged into a timer set to a 14 hour photo period. No accommodations were made in regards to temperature, the ambient temperature of the house is just fine for the species involved, and a smooth acclimation period was provided simply by covering the enclosure with plastic wrap and peeling it off over the course of the next few weeks. While no plants were lost, the near 100% humidity that was present during the acclimation period allowed for some algae to take a good hold. It creeped its way up the cliff and began to encroach upon the cephalotus planted right on the plateau. I was faced with a decision. Introduce the fan and more airflow, dropping the humidity and slowing down the plants in the process, or do something more direct with a syringe of diluted 3% hydrogen peroxide. I went for the latter, squeezing out drops of peroxide only onto the most troublesome areas. Out of all the decisions made, the choice to treat the algae with peroxide was that which caused the most anxiety. But these decisions were not made in vain. I'm happy to say that the treatment was a success and the plants are thriving and it just looks amazing. As you can see, there are Drosera burmanii seedlings everywhere. They are voracious plants and they have taken every bit of food that I could give them. Look at those little gems. The cephalotus on the cliff haven't skipped a beat and they even look healthier than they did before their move into Humpty Doo. I haven't fed them as of yet because overfeeding can be quite easy with juvenile plants and too much food can kill the pitchers and even grow mold. Moving down the plateau, we have the Drosera burmanii Humpty Doo, a deep red cultivar. This plant hasn't quit flowering since being introduced to the terrarium. I've trimmed the flower stalks off since, but I want seed this time around, so I've been letting it do its thing. Along the bend, we have a little clump of Drosera pulchella, a pink flowered variety to be specific. I was worried about the roots of the plants while planting them. It's not unknown to have pygmies die once the roots are too far disturbed. Fortunately for me, that was not the case. While hard to feed, these little gems have been rewarding me with perfect little pink flowers since their move. At the base of the terrain is the sphagnum bog, home of the Tracera adelaide giant forms. When the terrarium was first constructed, the plants had a head start on the sphagnum. But now that the sphagnum has had time to establish itself, they are neck and neck. The pair have been growing steadily since being planted, and the presence of more live sphagnum will help with the generation of smaller adelaide pups and plantlets in the future. Last but not least is the Utricularia. I was under the impression that I was just introducing one species, Utricularia sandersonii, but it turns out I also had a hitchhiker. So now we have another bladderwort species to add to the list of Humpty Doo residents, Utricularia bisquamata. 
After rewatching the last episode, I even saw some flowers from this new species amongst those of the Sandersonii. I assumed the unfamiliar flowers were simply underdeveloped or stressed attempts by the plant, but I was wrong in the best way. The live sphagnum is looking beautiful as well, so squishy and soft like a water-filled edelweiss. It's even making its way up the small cliff, making a lovely water-laden scaffold for the utricularia. I did have to mist the sphagnum pretty regularly at the beginning. I would find it drying out faster than the water could wake up, but now that there's enough of it, the sphagnum has no problem accessing the water from the reservoir. One thing I didn't expect is that the live sphagnum acts as an early warning system for the reservoir. With the moss holding up to 26 times its weight in water, it's the first to start drying out when the water level gets low, giving me plenty of time to refill it before the other plants are negatively affected. How convenient. Speaking of plenty of time, I've been feeding these plants about every two weeks, making sure to give the plants enough time between meals to digest what they can, and enough time afterwards for them to produce some new leaves. I've found that giving these plants the extra time allows me to stay on top of any mold growth that may arrive from old food or other decaying plant matter. Overall, this is a very low-maintenance setup. The only true requirement now is to change the water on occasion. Since it is a closed system, minerals and other dissolved solids can build up and burn the roots of the plants, so it's always wise to flood the terrarium a little, drain it, and refill the reservoir to the appropriate level with clean, fresh water. I've been doing this every month or so and have yet to have any problems. Just look at how well everything has grown. This terrarium is doing better than I could have ever imagined. What do you guys think? If you have any tips for these botanical endeavors, let me know in the comments. And not just care tips, if I'm pronouncing something incorrectly, providing the wrong care information, or just simply boring you, let me know! Because my goal for this channel is to provide high quality, accurate content about these peculiar plants, and I can't do that without your help. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.